few minutes uh, going through the UDC product line and uh, going through the model selection guide, understanding the, the nomenclature and the model selection guide, doing a little bit of troubleshooting and then uh, pressing some buttons there at the end uh, to get into some programming and uh, allow you to step through the configuration of the UDC uh, through uh, an online video today that we're going to share with you uh, while I sit down and program the UDC. So um, with that, let's go ahead and get started into the, uh, into the training here. UDC controller. So Honeywell has had PID loop controllers, geez, probably back through the 1960s and 70s. Uh, in the 1980s, they came out with a uh, quarter in UDC controller line. Uh, the UDC stands for Universal Digital Controller. Uh, so each one of these quarter in controllers in the UDC family um, have universal inputs and universal outputs to, to pretty much accommodate any uh, application that might be out there as far as PID loop control. The, uh, the UDC controller, uh, the nice thing about it is uh, since the UDC came, came out in the 1980s, uh, the programming has remained the same through all of these years and uh, through all the revisions of the UDC. So uh, that's pretty nice because there's a lot of products out there today that when they change revisions or come out with a new model, the programming changes and you have to relearn the controller. But in, uh, in the UDC uh, controller, that's not the case. Um, I got a good friend of mine, president of Lloyd Instrument, that uh, says the UDC is like a good flannel shirt that you put on when you come home after work. It's nice and comfortable. Uh, you're, you feel comfortable in it. It's kind of the same thing with the UDC. It, uh, once you learn how to program it, uh, which doesn't take very long, um, it's, it becomes very comfortable and it's kind of that nice go-to product that, uh, that will help you get out of a, a lot of different uh, uh, situations and applications that you need to have a good controller. So let's go ahead and dive into the model selection guide. The model selection guide uh, that Honeywell has is a uh, typical Honeywell model selection guide with a lot of digits. <laughs> and sometimes it's hard to really try to pick the correct controller for your application, but in today, uh, today's training, I'm going to walk you through that model selection guide and help you uh, figure out what all the, the different options mean to you. Um, when we look at the UDC product family that Honeywell has, uh, they have very low functional uh, UDCs like the UDC 700 that's basically an indicator, um, all the way up through a UDC 3500 which is really a multi-loop controller uh, with some special math algorithms that allows you to do uh, position proportional, carbon control, uh, feed forward, cascade control. So it's a very functional two-loop controller. Most cases, uh, customers are typically uh, using the UDC 1200 through a UDC 3200. Those really serve a lot of the standard applications out there in the industry. And it doesn't matter if it's a heat treat oven, if it's an air makeup unit, if it's a, um, a vessel where you're trying to control level or flow into the vessel, um, anything that has a standard PID loop, usually those uh, three controls are uh, what, what will serve your, your application needs. Today, we're going to really focus on the UDC 2500. The 2500 can be used as a limit controller or a PID loop controller. And uh, it really has a lot of the same uh, features as uh, the, the 1200s and the 3200s. Uh, so at a later time, we'll probably do another class getting into some of the more advanced uh, PID loop controls, where then we'll get into uh, cascade, dual loop, uh, feed forward, and position proportional control. So as I was saying before, the, the UDC product line can really serve a lot of standard applications for closed loop control. Um, when I refer to closed loop control, this is where the PID loop has a feedback signal. It can be either from an RTD, a transmitter supplying 4 to 20. Uh, it can be from a thermocouple. Uh, but feeding the process variable back to the UDC and the UDC comparing it to the set point 
and sending an output to either uh, electric heating elements, uh, on off control. Um, it could be sending a four to 20 milliamp to a burner that's modulating the gas to a burner to supply heat to the process. Um, but this would be a, a very typical uh, closed loop application that uh, a UDC controller could fit into. Uh, not only heat uh, control or PID loops, but you can also apply it to uh, flow control loops, level control loops. Uh, this would be supplying a 4 to 20 milliamp input to the UDC from a transmitter uh, measuring flow and on this scenario, and then supplying a 4 to 20 output or an on-off output to a process control valve, which then would vary the, the flow to the transmitter. Next, we're going to uh, dive into the model selection guide real quick. Um, like I said, it, it's, it's good to go over this because there's a lot of functionality or a lot of options that you can choose in the UDC family these days. All of the uh, UDC product line has the same model number breakdown so it doesn't matter if you're using a UDC 3200 or a UDC 3500, all the model numbers are built the same way. So uh, while we go through the UDC 2500 today, uh, this can be applied pretty easily to the other controllers. The first table that we're gonna talk about is table one, which is your output number one. Uh, this is the main output of your control loop that's going to go to the final control device to control your heat, flow, level, whatever it is you're trying to control. And let's step through each one of these real quick to get a good understanding of what each one of these do for you. As you go through the um, selection guide on the right hand side, what you're going to be doing is taking each one of these letters that you choose and plug it into the main control number that's at the very top of the model selection guide. So the very first selection is C. Uh, this is for current output. Typically, current outputs are used to connect to devices like mod motors. Uh, in this example, it's an M7285 or a mod motor M7284. It can also be any other brand out there that's, that can accept a 4 to 20 milliamp input signal. Uh, in the Honeywell world, it's mod motors and Herculine actuators. Uh, both of those have the option for 4 to 20. The other option, though, could be that uh, maybe you're trying to drive a, uh, a heating system that has a SCR. In this example, is a watt low SCR on the right hand side. Uh, that provides, uh, UDC provides 4 to 20 milliamp linear output signal to the Wattlo SCR. And then in turn, it's uh, providing a voltage out to the heating elements that's in a, a oven or furnace or whatever you're trying to heat up. So here's some examples of real life applications out there that uh, can receive a 4 to 20 milliamp signal. Um, when you get into PID loop control, a proportional current output signal is usually the best bet in order for you to achieve or your customer to achieve ideal uh, control on their process. Uh, the reason why I say that is the linear output uh, gives you a very accurate signal and uh, it is noise immune. You can run it for very long distances and uh, it really gives the process some nice control where if tuned properly, will line out at set point and your customer will be happy because you won't be getting fluctuations in this process. So uh, most times uh, customers are choosing the C option if you have um, available to you a one of these types of uh, motors or valves out in the field that can accept that. The next up on your main output is electromechanical relays. Uh, typically, the electromechanical relays are rated at 5 amp. These would be typical for on-off control loops. Uh, in, the, in the Honeywell world, we have an M62 mod motor or an M94. Um, it could also be a Herculine actuator uh, that can receive on-off outputs uh, to uh, drive your process variable. 
You can also have your on-off output driving a contactor, um, in turn driving a heating element if you needed to. Um, the on-off control is, is a pretty basic form of control output. Um, these are for applications where you know customers typically aren't really worried about a little bit of overshoot or undershoot on their process uh, compared to set point or for applications where you might have a very slow responding process. Uh, for example, your, your thermostat in your home is basically an on-off control. And um, typically, your home thermostat is a pretty slow responding system where you can turn off the relay when you get a degree above set point and turn it on when you get to a degree below set point and, and your, your heating system in your house is usually pretty slow. So it's the same thing that can be applied for industrial applications. You know, there are processes out there that, that can handle an on-off, uh, slow, uh, steady, you know, process control loop. The other thing that you can do with on-off in the UDC controller is um, set up your control algorithm to time proportional. Time proportional is still an on-off type control system, but it allows for pulsing output to your final control device to give it a little bit more uh, controllability and utilizing some of the PID functionality in order to level out your process variable at set point. We'll get a little bit more into the dynamics of process control and time proportional algorithms uh, later on in the uh, training segments. But for now, uh, just know that you can use either time proportional or straight on-off output out of the UDC controller. The, uh, the next one is uh, solid state and open collector. Solid state output is still a relay inside of the controller, but it is a solid state relay. Uh, so at very low amperage, usually around one amp, um, typically, these are used for applications where you might have a lab oven or some type of lab device, um, not out in the plant floor, um, very seldom used. Uh, most customers do go with the electromechanical relay, which is the 5 amp, um, and you can also put an interposing relay between either one of these. The open collector trans, uh, transistor output these are for applications where you have a very fast transitioning output from the on to off state. And it supplies 30 volts DC out of the open collector trans, uh, transistor output. Uh, these are typically tied into what we call like a cryodome uh, relay. Um, when you supply a, a transistor output 30 volts to the solid state relay out in the field, um, these almost offer like a pulsed output to the electric heating elements, and it's somewhat linear. So you get pretty good accurate control out of using this. Um, typically, applications that require this, again, are, you know, batch ovens, uh, small batch ovens, like uh, a couple of the brand names I'm thinking of is like uh, there's Lucifer ovens out there. Um, typically like small testing ovens, uh, electric heat driven, um, but it requires very fast transition from the on to off state and uh, the open collector output does a very well uh, job at uh, doing PID control when hooked up to a solid state relay in the control panel. So these are some examples of some lab ovens that typically use uh, that, type of, uh, that type of driving mechanism. The next uh, selection, and we're still under table one, uh, the next selection is uh, output to or alarms. Um, in applications where customers require a, uh, an alarm output to activate a horn, a tower light, uh, there's a lot of different, different types of alarm, visual or, or uh, audio uh, indications of alarm present. This is where you select that output that's going to energize those. If you select the B option, this is going to supply you with one electromechanical relay and then one available socket so that later on, um, if you wanted to add an additional relay, 
you could purchase that from Honeywell as a separate item and plug that into the board. Um, but really, at the end of the day, that's about a $35 option. So a lot of the times what customers will do is they will just go with the E option, which actually allows them uh, two relays on board, uh, five amp uh, on the uh, UDC. And now that's, this provides them two alarm outputs that are available to activate on process variable, percent output, set point, deviation from set point. There's a lot of different things that you can configure the alarms to, to activate on. There's also available the solid state relay. Um, again, these are rated at one amp uh, plus one alarm that's rated at five amp. Uh, you can also use, you know, it says output two as well. So let's say, for example, you had a heat cool output where you're energizing a heat relay for a valve or for a uh, electric heating element or, or a burner, and then you needed one additional output for the cooling side of your output, um, you could use output two to accommodate a heat cool type operation. Table two, as we move along the model selection guide, table two is uh, communications and software selections. So as you can see, there's a lot of different things that you can get within the UDC controller that will enable you to uh, have auxiliary outputs, digital inputs, and communications. The first selection, which is a number one, gives you an additional four to 20 milliamp output and two digital inputs, or one aux and one digital. The auxiliary output can do a lot of different things for you. Uh, pretty typically, this is used for applications where customers want to retransmit a process variable or set point signal or percent output to a, a third party device like a recorder, um, a programmable logic controller, or some other device where they want to monitor those uh, items remotely. Um, if you use the 4 to 20 milliamp out of the controller and if it's programmed accordingly, you can actually retransmit that pretty easily to a third party device. The digital inputs on a UDC can be used for a lot of different things. Um, these are for applications where customers might, might want to have a push button on the front of the panel or a input from a PLC or a third party device that will force the controller into a certain mode. Uh, or force the controller into a second set point. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can have the controller do by using just a dry contact between two pins on the back of the UDC. You don't have to supply a voltage to the two pins. Um, it's just basically a dry contact. And when that contact closes, based on the programming, will allow the UDC to do certain functions uh, that you needed to do from a remote standpoint. The next option would be communications. There's, there's actually two different types of communications in the UDC. Uh, this is selected by the number two in the model selection guide. The first option for communications is RS-45 communications. This, this communication is usually a three-wire communication from the UDC to a third party device like a PC, a PLC, or can even be a recorder if you wanted it to. The RS-485 is usually a three wire communication. Uh, the communication language is Modbus. Uh, there's really no other uh, selection at this point uh, to choose a different language, but uh, at this point it is Modbus communications. What's nice about the RS-45 is you can go up to pretty long distances. Um, long leads up to about 1,000 feet with the RS-45, a uh, maximum of 32 devices on one single link. And um, with the Modbus communications, you can gather information like your process variable, your set point, your percent output, which is typically what um, customers want to see uh, from a remote standpoint but there's a whole lot of other registers within the UDC that you can um, get to with the Modbus communications 
um, even as far down as uh, the programming itself, uh, each one of the programming items in the UDC have a register for Modbus that you can change with the uh, Modbus communications. It is bi-directional. So the UDC, what I mean by that is you can read or write uh, certain uh, Modbus addresses within the UDC. Um, and if you have a third party device, uh, like a PC that has uh, like a SCADA package on it, like SpecView, Wonderware, Interlution, uh, there's a lot of different other software uh, SCADA packages out there. Uh, Honeywell has Experion. Uh, these can communicate to the UDC through the Modbus language and uh, it allows for a very nice interface from a, a standard desktop or laptop PC to monitor what's going on with the UDC out in the uh, plant floor. The next form of communications, which is uh, selection number three, is the 10 base T Ethernet. Um, this comes along with uh, a uh, RJ45 connection or a straight terminal connection on the back of the UDC, which allows Ethernet Modbus communications to a third party system uh, using a, a uh, IP address, uh, Ethernet cable plugged into the back of the UDC. And again, you can access all the same parameters that you did uh, using Modbus. And this would be called Modbus RTU uh, utilizing Ethernet. Uh, typically, and this is pretty much standard wide uh, out, out in the industry, the Ethernet connection uh, from the UDC to the plant network, that first distance is about 250 feet maximum. And if you run more than 250 feet, you usually have to have a hub or a switch. Oh, oh yeah, hell, I'm the only one in here. Oh, if, uh, if you could go ahead and mute. Uh, I don't have any calls, so. <laughs> let's go ahead Jake's and mute. Off and Shelby's working at home, so there ain't nobody here but me. Okay, so let's uh, let's go ahead and get back. Uh, let's see here. So the uh, Ethernet communications is a uh, is a great way to uh, get the Modbus communications back to a third party PLC or PC uh, using the Ethernet communications. Uh, very fast communications. Um, one thing to note here, though, is that if you are changing the IP address. So each instrument has to have an IP address, just like a PC on a network. Um, the default IP address is 10.0.0.2. And if you wanna change this, you have to change it with a uh, piece of software from Honeywell uh, that will allow you to communicate to the UDC, program the UDC and actually change that IP address. But it's not able to be changed from the front face of the UDC. So that's just one thing to note if you are um, using the Ethernet communications there. As you move through all the options here, you, uh, you still have everything that's available in uh, selection one, but when you go from two to three, you add the 45 or 10 base T Ethernet communications, um, and three would give you basically every option that you want as far as communications and software selection in the UDC. The next option that uh, we have in table two, and this is one that I would recommend uh, anytime you choose a UDC 2500 for a process control loop, they do make it as an option to have a dual display with auto manual. Um, I always tell customers to choose this because if you're out in the field and you're starting one of these up, it is very, very tough to try to set one of these up without a dual display or an auto manual. Uh, the auto manual button is gonna give you the capabilities when you're starting these up to be able to put the loop in manual, run it from zero to 100% and make sure that your final control device is uh, actuating the way that you need it to. Um, it's a very quick and easy way to check that out. And uh, I would always suggest that the auto manual key is, is something that you want on every uh, UDC 2500 controller. The next would be the dual display, and that's still under selection A. The dual display is going to give you set point, 
and process variable, which is your actual um, media that you're trying to control, it's going to give you both of those on one display. That's always very helpful because obviously when you're doing control, you want to know where your actual temperature is while you're looking at the set point. The next option, which is B, B is a, a set point programmer. So if you have an application, uh, typically like a batch application, where a customer wants to ramp and soak the temperature over a certain time, this would be the uh, selection that you'd want to choose. You can actually do 12 segments and have uh, six ramps and six soaks within those 12 segments. So like, again, like I said, again, in batch applications, um, this is a very nice feature that uh, allows the customer to ramp and soak um, automatically and uh, uh, usually used in batch type applications like box ovens, furnaces, things of that nature. It only consists of one set point program, so if a customer wants to run more than one, uh, they'll have to move to a digital programmer. Uh, but for a very simple set point programmer, this, this will do just fine. The next selection in the UDC 2500, uh, still in table two, is L. L is for limit controller. <clears throat> so if you have an application out there in the plant that uh, is a heating application, or a cooling application, you can use the UDC 2500 as a limit <clears throat> approved controller that meets <clears throat> all the requirements of factory mutual. Factory mutual requires a high limit controller to have a, a latching relay and a reset button on the front of the controller. Um, if your application does not have a high limit or low limit, I would strongly suggest that uh, you recommend to your customer or if you're responsible for plant applications that, uh, that your process has this type of controller on it. Um, it protects you in many different ways, obviously from unsafe conditions that might have runaway systems that, that go above set point where uh, your actual temperature gets to critical status where it could uh, really cause harm to not only the process, but also personnel in the plant. Um, typically, this FM high limit is tied back in series with your limit string back into your flame safeguard circuit. So um, the UDC 2500 is the only one out of the UDC 25, 32, and 3500 that can act as a limit controller. The next table three is um, where you select your inputs to the process or your inputs to the controller. So as you can see, there's two inputs available. The first input is a high and low level input. So you can accept thermocouple, millivolt, RTD, zero to five, one to five. When you select uh, number two, it gives you a resistor inside of the uh, box with the UDC. Most times we stock this one um, as it serves all the different needs for process input and it gives you the available resistor. Uh, basically all you're doing is you're putting a 250 ohm resistor across the output which gives you, gives you your 0 to 5 volt um, signal. Uh, so this is, uh, this is something that we usually stock and is a, a pretty safe bet to go with selection 2. If you need 0 to 10 volt, um, there is another resistor option that actually gets put into the box along with the controller. But um, on input one, you can have either high or low level. On input two, you can have only low level or, or only high level, I'm sorry. The high level inputs are considered voltage or milliamp. The low level inputs are thermocouples and RTDs. <clears throat> the next table actually goes through different approval bodies, tagging information, and then Honeywell keeps a couple extra digits on there if it wasn't long enough already for future options that you can use, uh, that they can use for adding features to the uh, UDC family down the road. Uh, the approval bodies, uh, CEULCSA, which is a standard under selection zero. 
Uh, the next one would add FM. So I highly recommend if you're using this controller as a high limit that you include the factory mutual stamp on the box or on the controller as if you ever had a, uh, an incident in the plant. Uh, this can be assured that uh, the factory mutual stamp was on the controller and that um, the insurance bodies that are coming through the plant will see that and, and gives you a safety net. You can also do tagging. You can have stainless steel tag on the instrument. Um, a lot of times out on the plant floor, uh, customers will have a, a numeric, alphanumeric uh, tag on the instrument so that when you look at your PNID uh, drawings in the plant, you can identify where that, uh, where that particular product is on the plant floor and which asset is, uh, it's located on. The last table, is uh, talks about manuals. Uh, you can get a CD with a standard zero um, or hard, car hard copy manuals with either English, French, German, Italian, or Spanish. And then last but not least is certificate of conformance. The certificate of conformance is basically a certificate that gets shipped with the instrument that tells you that the UDC has met all the tolerances and specifications uh, that was um, that the instrument was built to. Um, it doesn't give you a calibration report. It just gives you a certificate of conformance that it conforms to all those standards that are on the spec sheet. Last but not least, there are restrictions. So when you go through the model selection guide on the right hand side, if you see a letter on the right hand side, come down to this table and it will tell you table one, if you have an A, um, is only available with E, A, or T. Um, it also gives you some other letters here that will tell you, talk to you a little bit about the uh, limitations of the model selection. At this point, it's, uh, it's uh, 30 minutes, it's 9 o'clock. Um, I am going to run a little bit over today uh, because I want to get into some of the programming. Um, we will probably spend about 15 minutes on this. So for those of you that have time to spend with us, um, I would really encourage you to do that because uh, as we get into the programming, um, it will show you exactly how to get into the menu structure. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the uh, uh, terminology in the programming. So at this time, I will uh, end the uh, sharing of the PowerPoint and we will go to the video. All right. So, uh, Roger, can you see the uh, UDC there on the video? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. All right. So, at this time, let me go to the uh, UDC. This is the fun part. Get to push buttons. All right. So, let's talk a little bit about the UDC here. On the front face of the UDC, um, at the very top, uh, it doesn't matter which UDC you have, you'll have the process variable. So this is the actual uh, uh, variable that you're trying to control the process to. And um, as you change your set point using the up and down arrow, you'll see the process variable track along with that as long as you have the process controller tuned properly. Um, if you have a 4 to 20 output, you'll probably see a nice smooth transition. If you have an on off output, you might see a little bit of swing in the process variable, but eventually it should come back down to set point. So as I raise and lower the button, it will, you'll see that that set point is actually changing. As I hold the button down longer, you'll see it jump to a, a next significant digit and it will uh, increase or decrease even faster. I'll show you a little trick of the trade. If you hold down the up arrow and pulse the other, um, the other arrow, it will automatically jump to that next digit and you don't have to wait for it to do that. Um, so that's a, that's a little, uh, uh, I guess, inside scoop if you didn't, uh, <laughs> if you didn't know that one. Um, on the right hand side, you'll see the uh, degrees F or degrees C. You'll also see an A or an M. 
The A and M actually signifies if the controller is in automatic or manual mode. So if I press the auto button or manual button, which is the same one, if I toggle it back and forth, you'll see that that lower display jumps from set point to OT, which is your output. The output in all UDC controllers are zero to 100%. So it doesn't matter if it's time proportional, if it's on off control, or if it's current proportional, those will always be zero to 100%. Now in a heating application, the zero to 100% um, is known as reverse acting in heating applications. And it's important to know that because as we go through the programming, there is a selection to choose either reverse acting or direct acting control. It needs to be reverse acting for all heating applications. So that means if my process variable goes above my set point, my output is going to go down because we want the gas valve or we want the heating elements to actually uh, turn off. In that application, you would actually see the output go to 0% or somewhere low. In all cooling applications, that's referred to as direct acting. So what that means is as my process variable uh, increases, my output also increases because I want maximum cooling uh, to be able to bring that process variable back down to set point. So that is terminology that you can use on any controller. Um, uh, direct is uh, direct is cooling. Reverse is heating. If I wanted to, in manual mode, change my output manually, all I do is increase or decrease that with my up and down arrow. Um, as I stated earlier in the 2500, this is an option. <laughs> so I would always suggest that you choose the manual auto key uh, when selecting UDC 2500 for control. Uh, the reason being is that if I was hooking up a mod motor or Herculine or some other motor that was hooked up to my burner out, in the, uh, out on the furnace or application that I'm trying to control the heat to, uh, this allows you to stroke the actuator and, and manually do that. So um, say, for example, I was setting low fire on a burner. I could bring this output all the way down to, let's say, 0% output. And then I could go to the crank arm on the actuator and adjust it a little bit up from 100% closed. You know, maybe you want your low fire position at 10% open on the mod motor or on the butterfly valve. Well, using this auto manual key allows you to do that very easily. You can also see if this was hooked up to a live process that my temperature would actually be going down because I'm manually adjusting that output down. If I walked up to the process and I turned this output up, let's take it up to 100%, you should see that output start to increase now. And it would increase pretty rapidly uh, So uh, in some applications. So you have to make sure that when you're using this auto manual key that um, uh, if you're doing type of testing or whatever, that maybe you have the contactor open or the relay open uh, not to affect the heating elements or have your gas shut off to the burner uh, so that you can uh, adjust this linkage on your crank arm on that butterfly valve without affecting any uh, uh, process disruptions in the, uh, in the application. The, the other thing to make sure of is that a lot of times we'll get calls that the controller is not controlling properly that uh, they have heat that's not coming up to temperature or they have a runaway condition where the temperature won't come back down. A lot of times customers have that all manual key pressed. The M is signified up on this display and that's one of the reasons why it's not controlling. It has to be in automatic mode just like the cruise control in your car uh, to be able to control that process. So um, I know it's a simple thing, but a lot of times that's one of the things that gets overlooked. Um, somebody inadvertently comes up, presses the auto manual key, and causes it to do that. 
The auto manual key is, uh, can be locked out in the configuration as, as well as all these other buttons. Um, so remember that when we go through the configuration. So let's talk a little bit about the, the, the programming. The, the programming has two keys, setup key, which is on the bottom, function key, which is on the top. The setup key is just like a Rolodex. It will move you through all of the major prompts in the controller and will eventually come all the way back up to the top. So if I had set, set tuning as the first major prompt, set point ramp is the next, auto tune is the next, algorithm, output algorithm, input one, where we set our input type, control, communications, alarms, display, calibration, and then eventually we'll come all the way back up to the top. Now, if you get into the tune or if you get into the configuration and you get lost at any time, you can just step away from the controller and it will start a timer that will actually default this controller back to set point and process variable. Um, and you don't have to worry. Or if you get lost at any point, just hit the lower display button and that's going to take you right out to the main display. So the setup key moves you up and down through the major prompts. The function key moves you in and out of each one of those prompts. So right now I'm in the tuning parameter. If I hit function, it will send me through gain, rate, reset, security, lock mode, which you can lock out certain keys, uh, enable the auto manual key, enable the run hold key, enable the set point select key, and then comes back to tuning. So again, the setup key moves you up and down. The function button moves you in and out of each one of those major prompts. Again, if I was in set point tuning or uh, in the tuning parameter and I, I needed to get out, I can hit lower display and it gets me out right back to the beginning. So let's go through, um, we'll spend a couple minutes here talking about uh, the major prompts and what things you need to program in those major prompts. And then we'll talk a little bit about some troubleshooting here to, to wrap up the morning session. So the first uh, button that we come up or the first prompt that we come up to is tuning. Um, there is a separate class that I'm gonna do on PID tuning. Um, to know, know this though, all or most controllers these days have uh, put together a pretty nice feature that allows you to do auto tuning. So if you're not familiar with doing the manual tuning process, there are in most cases a one button, easy button push that allows you the controller to auto tune the process and uh, eliminates a lot of time out in the field uh, starting these controllers up. But we will go through a manual tuning process in a class that uh, we will talk just about that and, uh, and how to accomplish that manually. So you can see that it reverted back to the, my, major, uh, my, my main display there. If I hit setup, I go back into programming. Let's go through tuning again. So we've got gain, rate, and reset. Think of these three numbers as uh, the... Uh, Back in the old days, if you had to change your carburetor on your uh, on your engine in your car, uh, which you don't do anymore, but if you had to, uh, you'd have to adjust some settings on that uh, carburetor in order for that um, uh, engine to work uh, optimal. It's the same thing on a controller. You have three tuning sets that, when set properly and uh, on certain applications, will give you the capability to ramp up to set point with minimum overshoot and undershoot and allow you to control your process at set point for however long the duration is at that point. So um, that's how I'm going to refer to tuning right now. And like I said, we'll get into that uh, manual tuning process at a later uh, training schedule. Uh, security, we're still under tuning. Security, you can set a, a number there to uh, lock out uh, certain features of the controller. And if the customer or yourself has that security code, they can come in here, they can plug in that security code with using the up and down arrow and uh, change it and then access certain features of the controller. 
The next is uh, we're still under a setup. We're moving through from setup tuning now to set point ramp. And the set point ramp, um, you are setting your set point program or a straight set point ramp from one temperature to the next temperature over time. Uh, typically, the set point ramp is used for applications where customers don't want to really shock the uh, the equipment. You know, maybe it, maybe it's the the brick or the the mortar inside of a heat treat furnace. Uh, it could be uh, a steel ladle in a steel uh, a factory. Um, it could be a number of different applications. But if the system cannot handle that shock, you can put a set point ramp in there which would allow that uh, controller to ramp from a low temperature to a higher temperature over a period of time, rather than hitting it with 100% output all at once. You can see it keeps on diverting back to that main display there. So that, that just shows you that there's that, if I'm not pressing a button that times out and it goes back. The set auto tune, if I, set the, if I hit the function button, that would work, uh, where we would enable the auto-tune feature. And if we enable the auto-tune feature, it's a one button push on the front of this controller. It usually only has to be done once uh, when you install the controller, or if there's significant changes, uh, whether it be the burner, or maybe they relined the furnace, uh, or there's some other uh, mechanicals that were changed in the process, you might have to come back and tune it again, but this should only have to be done one time at the beginning of startup. Algorithm, there's, uh, there's, if I hit the function button to go into algorithm, there's two different settings. Uh, for the control algorithm, I can choose PIDA, PIDB. In most applications, you are gonna use PIDA for all heating applications. Um, PIDB is, basically only utilizing um, proportional band and rate in the PID setting and not using reset. This is only used for a very, very few applications out in the industry uh, where you would need to use PIDB. Um, you know, you're probably looking at, you know, 2%, 5% of all applications might use that. Um, most times I use PIDA, um, so, um, that's what the initial setting that I would uh, uh, select for that. Output algorithm. Now here's where you set your main output. So if I hit my function button, you'll see that it says CUR on the top display and the bottom of the display says out alg. So that's output algorithm. And here's where I can choose current well, this particular controller is locking that one out. So <laughs> I can choose current, on, off, time proportional. Um, and I can choose also current duplex or time duplex. So you set your, your main output by using your up and down arrow, and it would allow you to change that, um, that setting up at the very top. It also asks me under that same prompt my 4 to 20 range. Um, I can make that 0 to 20 if I wanted to. Uh, most times it's going to be 4 to 20, and it goes back to set out. The next tuning prompt is, this is probably one of the more critical ones. This is your set input. So if I hit my function button, the very first prompt is input one type. I can choose 4 to 20. Uh, let's see here. RTDs. 0 to 5 volts, 1 to 5 volts, 0 to 10, parameter. And now you see the selection of all the different thermocouples, J, K, R, S, nickel, nickel, molly, R, T, W. So you can see there's a lot of different selections for your, for your input. We have this one set up for 4 to 20 because we're basically using this as a demo model and we have the output wired to the input, which does really, really nice control. <laughs> but the, uh, this is where you set your input type. So you have to make sure that whatever input you have hooked up, whether it be a transmitter, um, a thermocouple, an RTD, this setting has to be set correctly in order for you to read the right uh, temperature. 
You also set your input high and input low. These are actually set automatically based on the input that you select. Um, let me go back here to ratio real quick. This is a critical one. Ratio, most cases you're gonna leave this at one. The reason why I say that is because this is a multiplier. So if I have a one in there, whatever input I'm reading is multiplied by one and that's my process variable. If I was reading, um, or if I had a two in there, that would mean that whatever my process variable is times two would be my reading. A lot of times customers will, will go in and change that number and it really raves havoc on the process because now they're not reading the right temperature. So always make sure that when you come down to input and you go into input with your function button that the ratio is set to one. In most cases, this is what it's going to be. The next selection is bias. We're still under input one. Bias is you can set your engineering units. Um, so for example, if my temperature in the oven was reading 102 degrees with a third party device and my UDC controller was reading 100, I could come in here with the bias and I could bias that up two degrees by putting two degrees in here with my up, bar, up arrow. Now it's going to match whatever that third party device is reading. Um, same, same thing with uh, if you had a UDC 25 controller, under controller next to a high limit. A lot of times if these two controllers are next to each other, um, if they're a couple degrees off, which is pretty typical, um, especially if you're in a big heat treat oven or an air house or some other application where the thermocouple or sensors are, uh, are separated from each other. Um, sometimes people have issues with the, the difference in the temperature. So you can come in here and you can offset with this with the bias and have both instruments read the same thing if you wanted to. Um, most cases though, if you're biasing anything more than five degrees, um, you're gonna probably wanna do a recalibration of the instrument. Um, five degrees is, is quite a bit to be biasing the offset. Um, and, and also based on whatever your calibration standards are within your plant, uh, it might only allow for a certain amount of degrees for there to be bias. Um, set control is the next one. When you go into set control, this is all the control parameters. So um, you typically, you choose one PID set, although you could choose two if you needed to. Uh, two PID sets would be used in applications where you might have a heat cool output. Uh, local set points, you can choose one or two. And you, if you choose two, you can um, press the set point select button and it will toggle between both set points. In this application, we're going to only use one. Uh, set point tracking, alarm. How do you want the UDC to power up? Do you want it to power up in auto local set point, manual mode, um, auto manual local set point, auto manual set point? So there's a lot of different ways you can have the UDC power up. Um, when you apply power to it. Uh, set point high, set point low. These are for uh, examples. If you do not want the operator to be able to adjust the set point uh, above a certain value or below a certain value, you can set these limits in the controller. Uh, the next is reverse acting. Here's where we talked about reverse or direct acting. Reverse is going to be for heating. Direct will be for cooling. Uh, output limits is the next. Uh, we're still under control algorithm. So this is where you set your output high and low max. So it's zero to 100 percent. Your fail safe values. So this is if the controller was to fail, what output do you want the controller to go to? In this instance, it's zero percent. And gain, this is where we get into the PID set. So we get back to set control. Um, running a little bit short on time here, so let's speed things up here. Um, the next would be set communications. Here's where you set your address for your communications. 
Uh, each instrument has to have its own unique address on the communication network. Um, so you would set this by using your up and down arrow. And again, on a Modbus link, uh, you can have 32 devices. So this would be address one through 32. There's also a IR port at the very bottom here. The IR port can be used with an IR1 connected up to a PC or laptop and actually use the configuration software uh, without connecting wires to the instrument to upload, download programs to the controller and uh, through this, this IR port on the bottom. Uh, last setup is your alarms. So as I said, if you chose a controller that had two alarm outputs, you could come in here and change each one of those alarm inputs or set points. The first is alarm one, so A1, S1, TY. So that's alarm one, set point one type. Now we can change this by using the up and down arrow and we can say, I want that alarm to be input one, input two, process variable, deviation, percent output, shedding from communications. So if we lose communications, event on, event off, uh, manual, remote set point. So you can see there's a lot of different things that I can set up for that alarm to activate on. Um, but that setting is, is under this very first prompt, which is alarm one, set point one type. We also have alarm one, set point two type. This is where we would set our second alarm. Alarm hysteresis, if we want it latching, and that would be it for the alarm setting. So uh, when we get done with our configuration, we can hit lower display. That'll take us back to the, the main display. And if you have everything programmed right, um, this controller will work just fine in, in, in all applications that you have. Um, a couple troubleshooting uh, techniques, or let's talk about a couple shortcuts here real quick before we wrap up. If you have a controller where you think the calibration is not correct, instead of going through a uh, calibration from, from the beginning, you know, hooking up like a calibrator and, and going from zero to span, a real quick way to check to make sure that you have the correct calibration in the controller is if you go down to input one and you hit function to go to input type, change that input to something other than what you have hooked up to the instrument, hit the lower display to back out of the uh, uh, configuration, go back into the configuration and change that back to the original uh, input type. What this does is it diverts the calibration back to the original factory uh, uh, calibration where the instrument was manufactured and it, and it defaults it back to the factory state. So if you think you have a calibration off, that is one good way to, um, to try to figure that out and, and just divert it back to the calibration at the factory. Um, I would recommend this only as a troubleshooting technique um, I wouldn't recommend it for doing calibrations on your instruments um, as a standard, but for a quick troubleshooting tool, that'd be a great way to figure that out. Um, if you have a temperature, let's say you have a type K input and your, your top uh, temperature is all the way upscale. Let's say it's 2424 for a type K thermocouple or 2400. That is indicating that the input has failed and burnout condition, and it went all the way upscale. Now, there's a couple things you need to check there. You can check, first of all, lead wire that's going from the controller to the thermocouple or, or whatever input that you have coming in. Uh, a lot of times we see lead wire burn up or, or short it out um, in those cases. Um, so check your lead wire, and then also check your thermocouple or sensor right at the application. Make sure that all of those are still in good condition. If it is, then you might need to check calibration on the controller. But if you do see an upscale burnout, typically it's your, your thermocouple input that's, uh, that's causing that. The other thing that we see typically is that, let's say I have a set point of 1600 degrees, but my actual temperature is reading ambient. 
Usually what causes this is frayed thermocouple lead wires coming into the back of the instrument. If those lead wires get frayed and they touch on each other, what that does is it now makes a reading at the back of the instrument or wherever those two connections are being made. And wherever that gets made, you're going to read ambient temperature. Because if we know how thermocouples work, wherever you have that butt weld or uh, those two dissimilar metals touching each other, that's where the temperature reading is going to happen. So if you do have that where you're not able to control the controllers at an ambient temperature, uh, first check to make sure that your lead wires are not frayed. The other typical, uh, two typical error messes that, messages that you can get is uh, one is out fail. If you have a out fail message that pops up at the top of the display, that means that either one of the wires going out to your current proportional actuator or device is, uh, is open or has been broken, or the actual final control element, whether it be an actuator like a mod motor or Herculine, is not uh, functioning properly, and somewhere that connection has been broken. If your 4 to 20 milliamp output has uh, been broken at some point in that loop, you will get an out fail at the top of this uh, uh, top of this display. The very last warning that I'll tell you on the UDC is the UDC has a mechanism built into it where it actually measures the health of the thermocouple. Um, the way it does this is that every thermocouple has a manufactured specification tolerance on resistance. And what the controller will do is it will measure that resistance and at certain points on all thermocouples, when that resistance hits a unsafe condition, you'll get a TC warn on the top display of that UDC. And that means that there's imminent, uh, uh, failure is imminent, that it will happen in a short period, and that uh, you need to change your thermocouple before that happens. So those are the uh, those are a couple of the troubleshooting techniques that I wanted to share with you um, with the programming. I know we ran a little bit longer today. My apologies on that. Uh, but um, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up today's session. Um, first of all, let me ask the uh, the crowd: Is there any questions that you have today uh, from uh, today's UDC controller training? Make sure that uh, if you do have questions, you unmute your uh, your microphone there and go ahead and ans ask them. And uh, uh, I'll give you a couple couple seconds here. Okay. Um, with that, what we'll do is uh, we'll wrap up today's session on uh, UDC controller training, PID training. Um, and at a later time, we will be adding a couple classes on manual PID tuning. Um, we'll also probably add another class on the a little bit more advanced controller like the UDC 3200 or 3500. Um, but if you have any questions at all or any time, feel free to give us a call at any one of our offices in Cleveland, Indiana or Fort Wayne or myself. And uh, we'll be glad to help you uh, with any questions you might have on the UDC controller. So with that, we'll uh, go ahead and wrap up today's session and look forward to uh, seeing you all next Tuesday. And uh, have a safe, uh, safe day, and we'll talk to you soon.